first of all. Uh, thank you very much, Sabina, to be with us. It's a real, real pleasure. And thanks for all the audience. So today you have the pleasure to receive in our seminars of the History, Philosophy and Biology Teaching Lab, Professor Sabina Leonelli. She'll talk to us about globalizing plant knowledge beyond extractive epistemologies, lessons and challenges from crop data science. Sabina is the director of the Exeter Center for the Study of the Life Sciences at Guinness. Uh, she's also a theme lead for data governance, openness, and ethical strand of the Exeter Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. And she's a Turing Fellow at Alan Turing Institute in London. She's also the editor in chief of the International Journal of History and Philosophy of the Life Sciences and associate editor for the Harvard Data Science Re Review. And her research, which is really recognized and well-known and, and full of impacts, spans the fields of history and philosophy of biology, science, technology, studies, and general philosophy of science. So it's truly, truly a pleasure to have you here, Sabina, and uh, I'll leave the floor to you now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. <clears throat> thanks so much for the invitation, Charbel. It's just great to meet colleagues that I don't usually see, and um, and I would love to hear your comments and and also hear about what you're all doing um, in your different parts of um, Salvador or elsewhere in Brazil or even elsewhere like from Brazil, um, as I've heard. Um, so yeah. So what I thought I would do for today is. One of the parts of my research at the moment, which is the closest, I think, to uh, some of the issues that Charbel and, and his group are so effectively uh, looking at, uh, which is this question around how do we, what do we learn from local knowledge and how do we think about these very many bridges and mediations happening and uh, between local knowledge is particularly to do with agriculture and, um, and crops and uh, what is going on at the level of very high level science and uh, data integration, um, particularly in the global north, that sort of um, absorbs this knowledge, if you want. And so uh, let me just share my screen. So what I want to talk to you about is, is basically, you know, one of the two halves of my empirical research at the moment. Um, concerns um, this question around um, crop data science and how uh, this is organized in terms of um, actually bringing together data from different parts of the world and what kind of issues this throws up um, from a philosophical perspective, but also from an ethical perspective and basically the two things together. And, and this is part of a much broader book project that I'm involved in now since already many years, who knows when I'm ever gonna finish it, but it's really looking at a different way of thinking about empiricism, broadly construed. So I'm happy to talk about that if you're interested. But so I suppose just to get to the key point of the talk, and this is really what I'm gonna try and, and think about here, is the fact that I've been thinking about uh, how does one circulate data and research components for a long while now. And um, I've been for quite a while worried around questions of epistemic injustice and how does one um, try and uh, make sure that the ways in which we integrate different perspectives, different kinds of knowledges within the scientific system as a whole is as fair and robust as possible. And also strongly making the argument that um, having that kind of multi-perspectival and um, very diversified pool of resources for research is absolutely indispensable for making research results robust and actually giving us knowledge that we can trust and which is actually better knowledge of the natural world that we would have otherwise. But I guess um, as I've been doing this work, um, more and more and more, I've started to worry about the broader context for these kinds of um, efforts. And in fact, how does one do this kind of work, kind of bring together different knowledges, kind of make them visible um, to um, say data linkage platforms of places where this knowledge can be put together and integrated, while at the same time, trying to defend the participants in these efforts from a broader social context, which is really unfavorable uh, to many of these contributions and where there are very big power differentials between people participating and there is systematic injustice going on with respect to some of the participants to these efforts. And of course, particularly farmers and breeders in the case of uh, agricultural knowledge. And um, so what I wanna try and talk about here is this tension that I see between this effort that, of course, many philosophers have increasingly gotten interested in, you know, how do we 
um, produce scientific knowledge which is as, as open as possible to influences from all sorts of different kinds of knowledge traditions and actually uh, usefully bring them together to get to know, you know, the biological world better. And questions around how do we make sure uh, or we try and um, um, fight against the exploitation of um, knowledge extraction and bioprospecting from local communities that seems to underpin the great majority of efforts in agricultural research at the moment around the world. So to do that, I'm going to try and focus on contemporary efforts to share crop data, and particularly uh, cassava, which is a route that I've been uh, focusing on in my work for a while now. And um, of course, I'm going to talk mostly about data, but I want to emphasize the fact that many similar considerations um, also apply to things like material samples, models, methods, and of course, um, this applies to agricultural domains, but I think, again, similar considerations would apply to marine environments and environmental science uh, more generally. So pretty much any research that's relevant to planetary health, which kind of means almost any empirical research at the moment, may be subject to these kinds of considerations and tensions to a larger or um, smaller extent. So just to say something quickly about data linkage as a tool to study agrodiversity, um, people working in uh, agricultural policy and agricultural research uh, at the very, very least since um, you know, the period after the Second World War, though of course these efforts um, also predate that uh, substantively, have been working very hard on trying to make sure that we have some data platforms or forms of data exchange that allow us to get information from fields all over the world uh, to compare um, what is going on with different crops under different environments and to think uh, at also at an international coordinated level around um, food um, cycles and agronomic research more generally. And these efforts have now been identified, uh, intensified because of the rise of data intensive technologies and infrastructures, which allow us to get uh, more data about more things in the natural world, if you want, and more processes. And, and so in the case of agriculture, this would include having predictors for the health of the soil and the performance of crops, of course, uh, monitoring very closely the spread of pests of crops uh, and therefore detect diseases evaluate different types of stresses, biotic and abiotic, uh, do studies of agrodiversity at different levels, um, from morphological to genetic, and um, think about what may constitute valuable biomarkers, so using genomic research in that sense, and um, think about all sorts of things from photosynthetic capacity to how do we model multi-scale phenomena to uh, how we integrate agricultural data and crop data with environmental climate and health data. So all of this is a land of opportunity, if you want. One of the key players for a long time in international discussions about how on earth will we bring these kinds of data together, which standards would be used, which platforms would be used, has been the CGIR, uh, the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. Um, I bet you're all pretty familiar with this organization. Um, this has existed um, formally since 1971, though it has roots much before then, at least in some of the institutes. It's long been funded by mostly by US-based philanthropic efforts. So most recently, the Gates Foundation plays a big role in, in funding some of these institutes. And um, it basically comprises institutes mostly based in the Global South, um, over 10,000 staff, and all focusing on the idea of cultivating plant diversity for the resource poor. So this is really the biggest international research network thinking about agricultural development from a very much a scientific perspective, thinking about how do we collect agri agrodiversity information? What constitutes ag agrodiversity information? And I've done some work with Helen Curry. If you're interested, we can talk about that on uh, how the CGIR has worked very closely with the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, over the years and become ever more important as a place for technical expertise on how we actually exchange data, how we standardize the data, how we uh, taxonomize the data. So, um, in terms of thinking about broader technologies to make a uh, plant data travel, um, well, on the one hand, there is a very strong push, a new technology to try and collect and share as much data as possible, um, phenotypic data, so data about the morphology of plants, but also 
all the way to genomics. And this now includes also data on routes and uh, remote sensing, of course, done with drones, um, information from farmers, information from breeders, and of course, uh, indigenous populations and traditional and local knowledge. And this is often, if not uh, most typically done, through technologies which are actually themselves highly commercialized. Um, so we have seen a huge spread of agricultural tools that have become themselves data collecting vehicles. So it's no surprise that uh, many of the companies that used to um, uh, depict themselves as basically producing agricultural machinery are now transforming, like John Deere, for instance, transforming themselves into data analytics uh, companies uh, because a lot of their business comes from the data that can actually get from their machinery straight from the fields where people are working. Um, of course, there's a huge dependence on cloud services providers like the Amazon Web Services, for instance, and of all sorts of different kinds of robotics and smart technologies from smart glass houses to satellite and so on and so forth. Um, there's a sense in which national interests are still very important in funding efforts to uh, collect data and also in motivating the ways in which data travel around. Of course, this is partly because uh, the whole idea of data collection is partly really a colonial idea and a colonial heritage. Uh, the idea of seeing plants as national resources, uh, which then of course raises question about the sovereignty uh, of the nation over the, uh, the crops and the local knowledge attached to the crops that, that uh, are planted in this nation is important. Um, there have been, in fact, quite a few situations where uh, nation states have decided to try and intervene in data collection efforts to prevent uh, what they perceive to be uh, intrusions on their sovereignty um, in the form of bioprospecting. Uh, I think one of the most visible places has been happening in India, where uh, the traditional knowledge, the digital library, uh, which was storing quite a lot of information about plant compounds that were associated with Ayurvedic medicine ended up being closed for a period of time by the uh, Indian state um, because the perception was that actually this was being exploited by um, American and European based companies to uh, commercialize some of these um, medications and then of course sell it back um, as in good honor tradition of um, colonial medicine. <clears throat> and of course, um, there are also um, important negotiations happening all the time at the national, which are absolutely going through uh, national policies around how we in fact secure some sort of fairness in terms of germplasm exchanges and now increasingly also uh, data exchanges. So we can talk about what the what is going on in the commercial bi bi biological diversity at the moment where some of these things are being rediscussed um, very, very vehemently. I mean, we don't really have decisions um, from those panels as yet, but I mean, this, this is also gonna be very important in, in the next few years. At the same time, uh, despite the fact that of course, all of this kind of, um, state-based and um, kind of policy relevant discussions are going on. Uh, the interesting thing for me has been to enter this field um, because I was interested in how data were actually technically being uh, shared and realizing that for many plant data linkage initiatives and infrastructures, uh, this kind of national-based interest are much less evident than you would think. And this is partly because, of course, the majority of plant data are digital rather than material. And so, to some extent, they travel a more by reference to germplasms, and uh, which actually is the part of um, a material exchange that is some way somehow subject to international regulation. Of course, there's lots of governmental funding going on here, but very often this is structured by international consortia. And this is because a lot of people recognize that it makes no sense to construct um, data platforms that are purely national. And it, it makes sense to construct data tools that are actually cross-national or international. And, and that means trying to pull resources together. And also, of course, the, the fact that there are real difficulties in controlling data access within national borders. Uh, people keep trying and to some extent failing uh, to do that, at least in, in regards to some of these kind of large databases. And so there's a strong emphasis on international data structures. Um, so we have um, linkage infrastructures that tend to be supported by international consortia and agency very often pretty deliberately sidestep national borders and focus on improving the reach, comprehensiveness and interoperability of global data resources, for instance, by assembling multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder teams, trying to control and also provide standards and references for this kind of data exchanges and uh, make centralized infrastructures available for people to use. 
One example of this, uh, the most recent, I would say, is the attempt of the CGIR to bring together all their different data infrastructures uh, run by different institutes in the network to what they call um, one CGIR. Um, in this slide, I'm just giving you a sense of the incredible size of this project, right? The, the amount and the types and diversity of data that are involved here, the type of collaborators and companies that are involved in uh, supporting this kind of effort, the diversity geographically of the kind of regions that are involved. Uh, this is, we're looking at something which is really gigantic and very, very, very difficult to achieve. And indeed, um, because when it, when it comes to sharing this kind of agricultural data, we are not just looking at data on plant breeding or uh, germplasm but, uh, or agronomic research, but we're actually also looking at integrating data from climate science, for instance, and socioeconomic research on the different regions which are um, involved in these efforts. So here we come to the first problem I want to uh, tackle here um, briefly, which is the problem of trying to address so-called epistemic injustice. So the idea that many of those who engage in plant breeding and related data sharing are not typically recognized for their contributions and they're not really consulted when data are used or interpreted. And this is an unjust situation that it also um, tends to result in unreliable biological knowledge and potentially problematic agricultural interventions. And so uh, one of the potential solutions to this problem is to try and make data sharing and modeling efforts more inclusive. So bring in more perspectives on what counts as biological knowledge and what counts as an acceptable framework for agricultural development. So, you know, some of the dreams that uh, people cultivate um, when thinking about crop data sharing include try to reimagine agriculture away from high yield monocultures, try to have uh, exploit the fact that we have some reliable standards for data linkage, uh, which include, of course, taxonomy and genetic markers, and try and challenge these views of ethnobotany, especially as something which is extraneous to scientific research. The idea is that because now we are more and more interested in gene environmental interactions, we actually do want to incorporate as much as possible insights acquired through local knowledges about um, the effect of environmental stressors on particular varieties of plants. Um, of course, there's a lot of problems associated to this dream. And um, one of them is the fact that, and people in history and philosophy science have done a lot of work on this, uh, the standards that have been proposed tend to often misalign with at least some of the goals and the available expertise uh, in these kinds of networks. And this is partly because um, a lot of the taxonomies that are used here and the very idea of genetics that is used here and genetic resources is associated to a conception of biodiversity itself as a resource that can be actually um, capitalized. And Christophe Bernoulli especially has done a lot of work on this, um, as did a lot of historians, of course, Jim Scott especially, and Helen Curry on mass breeding. And um, there is, there tends to be a strong focus on elite breeds, almost as a result of that, which tends to actually exclude farmer knowledge and local diversity, as well as sustainable agriculture and uh, agrodiversity. There is an enduring molecular bias, uh, even if there's a lot of interest in trying and collect <clears throat> all sorts of different data. Uh, what we found is that there's still a very strong reliance on molecular data and genetic data as sort of the organizing principle, if you want, around which all of these other data are structured. And so they're given a primacy, which also then corresponds to a primacy in which kinds of expertise is seen to be central to understanding uh, agricultural science, which again are typically people who have access to uh, genomic expertise and um, relevant technologies. And this also, I think, matches up a preoccupation that we see very much in the policy arena um, in, in this case, which is mostly with DSI, so digital sequence information, as the type of data that is very problematic to exchange, with very little um, uh, international discussions happening now around, for instance, phenotypic data, which one would think are actually just as important. Um, this also means that there is a very strong emphasis on precision agriculture, which to some extent actually is not entirely compatible with a more contextualized understanding of gene and environmental interactions. Uh, as I said, um, phenotypic information tends to be rated as secondary to genetic analysis. And uh, because of the way in which pl plant information is platformed, it's actually quite difficult to complement existing taxonomies with taxonomies which are less gene-centric. 
And of course, because of the type of technologies which are used to do this kind of data exchanges, we in fact see a digital divide that is expanding instead of being reduced. And there's a very uneven access to cutting edge digital technologies by researchers around the world. And there's also an uneven capacity to make use of infrastructure and participate in how that infrastructure is in fact built and governed. And this, of course, comes with the usual uh, very big concern around what kind of surveillance mechanisms are being put in place now through all this data production with respect to, um, for instance, local farming uh, strategies. And of course, on the background of all of this, there are problems with benefit sharing. Uh, the fact that we know that the agricultural research is um, you know, vastly controlled by very, very few companies, uh, which have a very strong st stronghold on um, intellectual property regimes um, when it comes to them producing mass commodities um, that, for instance, seeds uh, that can be, and fertilizers, that can be then um, marketed around the world. And uh, there has continued discussion around who should reap the benefits of this kind of research, especially when it becomes commercialized and extremely profitable. This discussion for me, is, it continues to be extremely disappointing because it's very much focused on financial rewards rather than thinking about other forms of participation. Um, but, you know, we'll get to this in a second. Um, generally speaking, we're looking at a regime of agricultural development kind of broadly that has a tendency to erase cultural, biological, scientific and semantic diversity. This has, of course, severe implications for the biological understanding of plants um, more generally. So just briefly to get to say something about cassava. Um, so um, it's very interesting to note, at least to um, introduce this topic, that tubers and roots are have a very long history as what, what could um, define the um, quintessential sustainable in situ crop, which thrives on poor soil. It thrives under tough and pretty variable climatic conditions. It is rich in calories, less nutritious than cereals, but it's still uh, something that can actually um, feed a family or a community. Um, is typically relatively vulnerable to disease. And um, most importantly, I think for our purposes here, is the kind, these are the kinds of crops that grow pretty well in gardens and is more plots partly because they can be harvested whenever, so they, they can survive a long time under the ground, partly because once they're actually being harvested, they require intense processing um, to be transformed into food or into flour of some sort, uh, because otherwise they rot quickly. And so there's a sense in which this is a long history, which has also been documented by many of the early anthropological works as, you know, a, a type of... Um, crop that feeds life in the margins, if you want, in the garden, in a small hold, kind of an in situ crop in that sense. Uh, so here is a um, field uh, of a field trial of cassava. You see uh, the root here. Uh, I really don't need to explain to you um, how this works, given how important cassava is in Brazil also. And this is the kind of place which I've been visiting and doing uh, research on um, in the last few years. Well, with the, of course, the pandemic interruption in the meantime. Uh, cassava itself has been long ignored by plant researchers in the global north, uh, but long studies by anthropologists and, of course, uh, local agronomists, uh, both in Brazil, in Indonesia, and in Central Africa. Um, I'm not going to say too much about this because I don't have much time. Sorry, I'm just going to skip a few uh, slides here. Also, this one. Yeah, this one. So maybe I'm just actually going to show you this one. So um, one of the ways in which um, historically um, um, people who were interested, say, at the FAO or the level of international organizations, um, we're interested in um, trying to collect data about cassava field trials up and around the world. We we'll try and systematize that data is by using the so-called IPRI trait descriptors. And you see an example of this here. These are pretty static. As you can see, what's going on here is you pick up um, a, a, a plant trait, say color of the stem cortex. You assign a number to different colors. And that is a way, if you want to, um, in a quick and dirty way, quantify traits that are otherwise very much qualitative traits. And this has been extremely important in trying to um, make uh, this data collection a little bit more comprehensive, but still uh, very difficult because ultimately um, it was of limited use, in particular to breeders and breeders that wanted to uh, evaluate management practices and environmental stressors in, in, uh, across different sites and not just evaluate um, which kinds of germplasm you would give to which collection. So um, some of the challenges encountered in the field is, of course, the variability within and across crop types. I mean, if, uh, crop types, if you approach a field like this and you're trying to pick up specimens that you're going to be measuring, 
what is going to count as your specimen individual, what is going to count as a variety, an accession, an ecotype, and a strain, which of course is a big problem always with plants, how do you pick up something that's representative, this methodological diversity, lots of different skills and measuring methods to assess and um, collect uh, data about traits, and also this difference in time, not just in space, so the time of flowering and harvest uh, of different crops can actually, and the same crop in different fields can um, vary consistently, considerably. So uh, a lot is left to the judgment of the technicians and researchers on the ground around when actually data are being collected and what does it mean in terms of documenting the development of the plants. And of course, there's a lot of cultural diversity going on here. So lots of different ways in which varieties are named. And these varieties very often have an uneasy tax, um, relationship to traditional taxonomy, if there is any correspondence to taxonomy me at all. And again, there are big discussions around how one actually identifies what constitutes a valuable trait, um, where something that a local community may be seen as valuable, such as, for instance, the consistency of the pulp, uh, of the uh, of the root, as you see in this figure, may be quite different from what taxonomy is considered to be a valuable trait, which is definitely not uh, the consistency of the pulp or the root. <clears throat> So these kinds of uh, trade descriptors prove to be really problematic, too stable to actually be useful in the dynamic situation of the field, and the focus was just too narrow. It really didn't allow researchers to capture biological diversity, scientific diversity, or cultural diversity described in these terms. So um, I've done quite a bit of work over the last few years with this um, uh, tool called the crop ontology, which has been trying to, if you want, reimagine the way in which we think about phenotypic traits in a way that actually allows us to bring in much more of these different types of diversity and document them within our data systems. So this is the way the crop ontology is organized. Uh, you see it has um, different types of um, traits, um, so agronomic trait, morphological trait, physiological quality and stress, and under each of them you find a list of uh, different types of traits which are, which are then defined and uh, given an identifier. And so you get a cassava root and then you associate to different traits of the root a particular identifier and then you use that to collect your data. And one of the interesting things about this tool is that it actually is geared towards trying to capture as much as possible methodological variation. And the way they do this is for every trait, not to just collect the data themselves, the measurements, but also the measurement methods and the scale at which the measurements are being taken. Uh, so that actually you can go into the uh, database and you're able, if you want, to track down and reconstruct the differences in methods used by different technicians in different places to uh, put together the data and to add them to the uh, database. So just to give you a quick example here, this is um, somebody showing me, uh, you know, the consistency of the pulp of the um, of cassava, which is obviously very important, particularly for cooking. This will be something which is classified as a morphological trait. And in the um, crop ontology, we're going to find um, uh, various entries that relate uh, to um, data on um, the, uh, the surface and the pulp of the root, um, which you see kind of highlighted here. And what's interesting also is that, um, this is just a quick example, um, when you go and look at the metadata for some of these data, you will find different entries. These are basically two different institutes of the, CG, uh, the CGIR. Um, that actually are measuring, uh, are, are kind of taking different ways, uh, different methods to measure um, the color of the pulp uh, in different places. And what's also interesting is that uh, the attempt here is to try and capture social variation. And the idea with these kinds of bioontologies that are trying to capture everything people are doing. And in that sense, community science plays a pretty important role. So uh, at least in the location where I've been uh, working with at the IATA, so the International um, Institute for Tropical Agriculture, the way in which the um, crop ontology dedicated to cassava is uh, operating is that they have regular meetings with um, several breeders in the area, as well as farming representatives. And uh, these are regular meetings so that people can actually 
you know, learn from each other and um, breeders can also learn what the data scientists are doing and kind of think about it and then bring back experiences from the field on a regular basis. And um, the feedback that the breeders give in these meetings, they can very seriously and is used to transform and innovate um, the type of traits that are listed in the um, in cassava base and in the, um, in the ontology and um, also increasingly trying to think about out language translations uh, for this because of course uh, there's all sorts of difficulties here around what happens when you have a resource which is in English versus all the different local languages which are uh, used to identify particular varieties. So there's also very interesting work going on there including on gender sensitive participatory evaluation which I don't have the time to really talk about here. And this is the way in which um, the Research Data Alliance um, AgriSemantics Working Group which has been quite important in feeding into some of this work um, has conceptualized this approach to building data infrastructures, which they call communities of practice based. And the idea is basically to say, listen, I mean, when you're thinking about um, the way in which you call data or classify data, so-called data semantics, what you try and do is actually instigate a dialogue between all of these different types of stakeholders for instance, farmers, breeders, biologists, but also food manufacturers and chefs and nutritionists and sociologists, which is a kind of funny category, um, to try and make sure that all of those different voices of potential consumers of the data are actually heard and um, incorporated into data systems. So in that sense, actually, I think it's also very interesting to think about these systems as capturing a certain kind of biological variation. Uh, so I got very interested in this partly also because philosophically, I think, the sense in which what's going on here is you're trying to not just um, focus and capture data on the trait in itself, but actually on the relationship between the trait and the context of the trait, which includes the humans which are taking the measurements. Right? So I think it's there's a very interesting philosophical shift going on here, uh, which I've been writing about. But what I want to really um, come to uh, for the purpose of, of um, you know, uh, discussing with you is the fact that, you know, in a sense, you can say, isn't that just a great initiative? I mean, I've been very strongly involved in it. I, I really admire everybody who has been involved in this kind of initiative. Uh, everybody's been really, really well intentioned and try as much as possible to make this into an instrument for a proper work on agrodiversity and really trying to address um, urgent questions around food security in a way that was fair. And in so doing, one could say that the crop ontology has been very, very successful as a transnational data broker, right? Trying to mediate national and international coordination, the inclusion of multiple stakeholders, try to facilitate participatory practices for crop data collection and management, mediate between cross-specific local databases and international initiatives. And in fact, um, many of the people involved in this have participated in efforts to negotiate tensions um, arising from attempts to link locally acquired digital information into big global effort and networks and also uh, try and think about what happens to plant genetic materials and germplasm uh, when that um, happens. And of course, how this works is, you know, you, you have um, basically field books and tablets that have been set up partly uh, thanks to these tools, which people can use directly in the field to pick up data and then um, transfer to networks. And then um, this is basically released online immediately as an open data resource. But this takes me to problem B, uh, which is what I think a lot of people are constantly worried about in this community. So I, I very much say this in solidarity with them and as somebody who's working with them all the time which is, okay, if you have these kinds of tools and uh, this type of expertise and focus, how do you address the knowledge control regimes, uh, to use uh, Stephen Gardner's uh, terminology, which exists around agricultural development and the related several layers of social injustice that are associated to this system? So it is a fact that the global system of data sourcing and circulation remains under the powerful knowledge control regimes, which is exercised by very big agricultural businesses and data analytics companies. Um, this is widely critiqued, I think rightly, as uh, typically unjust to local farmers and very biased towards a market-oriented view of agricultural development, which is tied to increasing the yield of the crop rather than thinking about how different crops sit within particular local economies and um, environments. And of course, uh, if you take this argument seriously, then you may just, you know, in a sense, bluntly say, well, you can work as much as we want on the inclusivity of these data systems, but what you're really ultimately doing is making better and better instruments for bioprospecting. 
So how do we confront that problem? And I guess what I'm trying to do now in the kind of work that I'm doing, and here, of course, you can see, uh, you know, I'm trying to give a visual rendition of who may be the beneficiaries of some of the work that's going on now um, in Nigeria and um, around cassava, which may be uh, other CGR um, institutes, maybe other collaborators in nearby countries, but really also tend to be very many people in the global north, some of which are making a lot of money out of these efforts. And um, so one of the things I'm kind of, you know, looking for help in doing is to try and really think about how do we, working in history and philosophy of science on these kinds of issues, deal with what we know to be overdetermination of these situations by the political economy. Um, we know that epistemic justice at the level of um, producing more inclusive and better knowledge in those ways actually can come at a price. And the price can be, in cases like this, potentially to enshrine the idea that data is collected in the South and reused in the North, um, which continues to be an issue in these kinds of discussions, and the extent to which the data systems end up being laden with commitments to high yield agriculture. And we've written um, a few papers demonstrating some of this recently, where we looked at the ways in which um, once data get collected by software the crop ontology, but then it starts to be enriched and collected by and linked to other databases um, kind of at the international level, then what you see is that little by little um, there is a growing emphasis in these kinds of efforts on market-led models for precision monocultures, basically. So I think what we're looking at here is an enduring tension between what you may call epistemic justice on the one end and social justice on the other. Um, I'm not entirely sure this is really the way to cash it out. There's a sense in which what we're looking at is a, a justice problem overall and a knowledge problem overall. And the question is, how do we bring these this different types of efforts and levels of control that people have over, over these systems together? And how do we make sense of this philosophically? Um, so, on the one hand, I really do want to support uh, this kind of community science efforts and attempts to think about process sensitive naming, uh, which is you know, how I call these kinds of efforts, uh, which include local knowledge and uh, attempts to really capture sensory ethnobotany. Um, but at the same time, uh, we need to really keep sight of these questions around uh, agricultural development and the political economy of crop science. So, you know, the questions that then come out of this kind of work is, well, is inclusion in global data linkage circuits always a good thing? When is exclusion from these data linkage circuits a bad thing? And of course, most importantly, how do we think about data governance here in ways that may, in fact, facilitate um, uh, some sort of solution or reconciliation of these tensions? So really, what we're having here is two, two possible very different narratives for what datification in plant science and crop science may mean. On the one end, it is actually a really important instrument that we have at our disposal to try and transform long-standing knowledge regimes um, and systems that have been clearly quite damaging in, in very many places and to try and remanage, um, rem reimagine agricultural production. I mean, I cannot stress enough how important this is at a moment where agriculture is basically the biggest polluter in the world and the chief cause of climate change at the moment on the planet. At the same time, uh, one could look at some of those efforts and th think about them as an attempt to, in fact, privatize biological processes, right? You make food production traceable. That actually means that you can monitor and monetize everything from how plants are stored, selected bread and stocks, all the way through commercialization and uh, distribution and use on the market. And in that sense, this really becomes a natural extension of the Green Revolution and the intensification of agriculture. And that paradoxical wouldn't help you at all in trying to um, tackle uh, or potentially wouldn't help you to try and tackle the current uh, climate crisis, uh, despite all sorts of promises in that respect. So how does one resolve this tension? So um, what I'm trying to work towards at the moment that I really cannot give you, you know, the perfect answer. If I could give you that, I'll be at the head of the United Nations and, you know, like <laughs> Um, it seems that Sabina blocked it, or it's me. And I think it's... Uh, do you hear me, or Sabina? Uh, 
to affect uh, national and private uh, interest. And uh, I've written about this in a recent collection that just came out, uh, edited by John Kriege. So the question for me at this point is how do we conceptualize, uh, you know, how would we conceptualize data in a way that's different from just thinking about data as assets to be mobilized and controlled? Uh, how do we move away from that? And um, so the things that I'm trying to point towards is the fact that, well, um, first of all, um, trying to access data so that you can use it for research is not necessarily about controlling or owning the data. There are very interesting ways of trying to mine um, data platforms that actually are question driven. So you basically may run an algorithm through a platform, but you don't in fact need to even see the data to access that. There are people who are cultivating great expertise in, in, in actually governing data silos and granting access only for uh, sanctioned activities and purposes. Um, there is, you know, a lot of evidence that more data doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean um, being able to do better science. And I think uh, one important part of what I'm trying to point towards is the importance of um, thinking about data use as ultimately a social political question of representation, who is actually being represented uh, as part of the data collections, which viewpoints, and to which extent are the viewpoints and expertises involved uh, you know, and sort of embodied by the data, also involved in the governance of how data are being interpreted and used around the world. So I think focus on participative governance here, and um, in a report with the FAO, we talked about this as meso governance uh, is really, really important. And that's also something I've been trying to argue in, in a little book that is hopefully going to come out next year. I'm just revising it now on the philosophy of open science. So, um, you know, of course, the big question here is that the question I typically get asked when I try and talk about this uh, with people, especially with many philosophers, I'm sure not with you actually, um, is, you know, people ask, well, isn't just a question of the fact that, well, because you look at applied science, you look at things like uh, agriculture and so, this is a field that's very commercialized and um, isn't that just, you know, like this is the only place where we would need to really think about these questions of uh, data use as control, while in fact uh, that seems to work very well with other parts of science. And I think actually that's not the case. I think uh, looking at this type of examples very much also as the kind of work that Charbel is doing is really essential to get us to really reimagine what science is in general and, and as a fundamental um, set of activities, partly because what is and isn't commercially viable is very unpredictable and can change very quickly. And we've seen many, many examples of that in the history of science. And I think really there is a fundamental epistemological issue here with treating data as a quantifiable asset uh, whose value can be fixed at any one point. And that's the kind of thing I'm hoping to work on in the next few years. And I really look forward to discussion with you about this. Uh, Shabal told me to um, say something about uh, where some of this work has been coming out. Uh, all of the work uh, that I do and I do with uh, many of my collaborators in Exeter, particularly Hugh Williamson in the last few years has been absolutely wonderful uh, to work with on this, an anthropologist, um, is available on our site, opensciencestudies.eu. And uh, I have a paper on PTP bio that just came out, which very much looks at this question of process sensitive naming and crop ontology. And then we've been looking at these broader issues around the political economy 